Welcome to Talk to Brazil with Tom Riach, the business connector to business in Brazil. Welcome to Talk to Brazil, the business connection, the world's first English language internet radio program about business in Brazil, now on the air since 2009, and now also in podcast format. I'm Tom Riach, an American living in Brazil for many years and known as the king of networking and talking from my studio in Campinas, Sao Paulo, Brazil. Today's guest is Dr. Renata Theobo. She is a Brazilian living in China for over 14 years and talking with us today from Ottawa, Canada. Renata is head of research and business intelligence at web to asia an award-winning Alibaba Tmall partner agency in Shanghai. She's a researcher for Harvard University, a trainer and board of advisory member at Alibaba Business School, a professor of e-commerce at M. Lyon Business School in Shanghai, China. Renata speaks Chinese, French, Portuguese, Russian, and Spanish, as well as English. Renata and I met on LinkedIn during several of my Talk to Brazil interviews with persons in China. So with that, Renata, hello and welcome to Talk to Brazil. Hello, Tom. Good morning. And thank, Thanks for having me today. Ah, thanks yeah. for being with us. I've uh, been following you on LinkedIn and it's a pleasure. I, there are really few people that uh, uh, I've seen on LinkedIn that have the depth and breadth of a, a profile as you have. Uh, and the other day yeah. I saw one of your posts on LinkedIn uh, where you made a book suggestion, The Schopenhauer Cure. And I saw this post early in the morning here in Brazil. And what you wrote really caught my attention uh, because what you said, and I'm going to repeat that for our listeners, you wrote, sometimes we need to spend the time to reflect what we love doing, and the answer is always within ourselves. Uh, the book talks about reexamination of life and work, and I understand this as a need to set short and long-term goals and always evaluate if we are on the right path. And then you say, change can be good, but you need to be ready for it. And that really struck me uh, because I've changed. I've been here for many years, but like yourself, a Brazilian moving to China, I'd like you to talk now about your life's paths and journeys. What led you to China? Exactly. So um, usually I take all of my experiences and also I hear a lot to uh, experience the people. I read some books to find inspiration within myself to make sure that I am on the right path. And that's what I did 14 years ago when I decided to leave my small village in Brazil's countryside. So I'm not sure if you heard of Vila Velha. Yes. It is a, <laughs> yeah, this Garota's chocolate uh, city, right? Ah, so, okay. Yeah, we are famous for Nestle Garota chocolate. Ah. And it is a, it is a very small town of uh, 250,000 uh, people. And uh, at that time, there were not so many opportunities for me to grow in my career. So leaving that city was my only option. But it was very scary at the same time because I did everything on my own. And I decided to go to China because I saw that China would be the future. Right. Well, <laughs> China is the present, of course, <laughs> but I'm talking about 14 years ago. So imagine. Uh, that's why I chose China to be my second home. And I went to China by myself, alone, without speaking the language. Wow. So, yeah, be because of this, I really try to uh, actually find something new for my life, engaging in new activities, in business, especially to do business between Brazil and China. At that time, also for Garoto. Mm -hmm. And that's how I ended up there. Wow, then you, that's all amazing. It started from chocolate and then you went to China. Exactly. <laughs> When I, I saw from looking at your profile and further down shows, you went there as a representative for Garota Chocolates, right? Uh, and, yes. and now that's part of Nestle, right? 
Yeah, uh, Garoto Chocolate is part of the Nestle Group. Okay. It is uh, the leading chocolate brand in the whole of Latin America. Wow, and Chinese like chocolate? Um, actually, at that time, it was extremely challenging because uh, Chinese uh, consumers would think it is very sweet. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> so like in any business, when you go to another country, when you want to expand, uh, expand your business to another country, we, you need a certain level of adaptation right. um, concerning taste, uh, communication, uh, strategy, etc. <laughs> And now what you're mentioning, that, that is, I've talked to other persons who've gone out in the world, one of the things of taking product out in the world is that uh, you, you have to localize it. And what you mentioned in China, of, of Chinese thinking Brazilian chocolate is sweet, uh, I found that in the United States. Of companies, uh, years ago, I took Brazilian products to the States, and mm-hmm. it was the same, because Brazilians, which is for our listeners, Brazilian sweets are very sweet. Uh, and Brazilians like sugar. They like the sweet taste. <laughs> no, and, and, yes. and that's the custom here. Uh, but when, and as I went to the States, and I guess you saw that in China, you have to adapt taste. And I think uh, taste oh. is one of the things that's it's sort of peculiar to people, right? Uh, and right. to cultures. So it has, everything has to be adapted. Exactly. And there are so many uh, examples of brands that fail in China because they refuse to adapt. Mm-hmm. Uh, special fashion brands, big European or American brands, they really struggle when they go to China because it is such a different market. And consumers' behavior and tastes are extremely different as well. <laughs> Well, from the other podcast I've had, I've also learned that uh, obviously China is not one thing. Uh, if you, as you get into the different regions, uh, you have subcultures within the country. Yeah, that too. Imagine China as um, a gigantic country, right, mm-hmm. with uh, 56 different ethnicities, dialects, so you need to adapt. People from uh, north of China have completely different behavior from people from the south, for example. So you need to have a very concise strategy when you tackle them and divide by different regions, by different target audience. It's very interesting, though. Well, I've, well after 14 years, I, I see you've changed and you've adapted uh, and now with your research and business intelligence at web to asia uh, is that what you do while you're in China? You offer this service and your intelligence uh, to foreign companies wanting to get into the Chinese market? Yes, this is exactly the work I do for foreign brands when they want to open an online shop in China, especially on Tmall, mm-hmm. uh, which is Alibaba's uh, main marketplace. And... Um, what I do is 100% data-driven. Mm-hmm. So I analyze the whole uh, market and the data to see consumers' preference. So, for example, um, you have more than 100 products you want to bring to China. You do not need to bring all of them, mm-hmm. and some of them are not really suitable for the Chinese market. So we use a lot of data analysis to strategize their online business in China. And then you sub yeah. that. You mentioned this, the 56 ethnicities. Uh, so your data also does that type of subdivision to say exactly where you should point that to? Uh, yes, but by region, for mm-hmm. example, yeah. So we can target when you do uh, paid marketing for different regions, you can adapt all of the designs and the communication strategy to different audience. Well, that, well how exciting is all that? Because, uh, when we're talking about you know, Brazil's a big country, uh, but it doesn't have the diversity. Uh, obviously, we have the regions, we have the difference, but we have one language, right? And yes. Portuguese in the south, Portuguese to the north is not that much different. How do you how do you how do you do your journey and your path? How do you navigate in China? 
Well, I am lucky to be in China and to be in an industry that pushes me a lot. Mm -hmm. um, th there are changes every day, and I do not do the same work every day. I always need to improve my skills and to provide the best I can. Uh, so I do believe that Brazil has a lot to learn from China, especially regarding um, the digital industry. I know there are many players, uh, mm -hmm. big players in Brazil, like Americanas and Wines, mm -hmm. wines.com.br, for example, uh, magazine uh, Luisa. Right. They are really doing well in terms of e-commerce, but of course, it's not like China. I think Brazil's main challenge is logistics. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, um, so we have a positive point, which is the language, for example. But we also need to understand that people from north of Brazil think in a very different way from the south. No, that's true. And we have we have to consider that, even though we speak the same language. Well, you mentioned Vila Velha. You mentioned it's a small village. You know, 250,000 people is not small when you're talking about other regions in the world. Obviously, if you're comparing to China, uh, 250,000 is a drop in the bucket. Uh, but if we were talking to Denmark or Holland, 250,000 is an expressive market. Um, the problem of uh, Vila Velha is that we are near Rio, we mm -hmm. are near Minas Gerais, for example, so we get kind of outshined by Rio. Mm -hmm. and well, well, I feel that in Campinas. So. Campinas is very close to Sao Paulo, and many people don't know what Campinas is about. Exactly. <laughs> so I think, um, yeah, many, many industries, they prefer even going to Vitoria, the, the capital, Mm -hmm. or other cities, perhaps in, in Rio or Sao Paulo. But is that the same true in China? Is or with, uh, what comes to mind is Shanghai, where, where you live? Uh, no. But, but there are so no, many it, different cities there. <laughs> exactly. China is divided into Tier 1, Tier 2, Tier 3, Tier 4 series, so on and so forth. And um, even in smaller cities, they are very uh, developed. You have bullet trains. You also have uh, segmented industries. For example, EU is a very important city in China, and they manufacture small accessories, for mm -hmm. example. So I, I do believe that uh, in China's case, different regions, they have different strengths in terms of economic development because of uh, governmental support. Well, that gets back to the point that you mentioned about logistics. So uh, apparently what you're saying that uh, China has also solved the logistic difficulties of a continental-sized country. Yes, yes. So even in smaller towns in China, they are very uh, well developed compared to Brazil. Yeah, last year I saw a, uh, one of the groups that I take part in. Actually, they showed a, a video from Alibaba and Alibaba's work uh, with small and medium-sized, very well, small family-run companies. Mm -hmm. And what was amazing in seeing that video was the work done to real mom-and-pop type shops, right? Uh, of bringing yes. technology to a, a very small one-door uh, commerce. Yes, this is a program called the Taobao Village, and it is a public-private initiative. Of course, it is uh, it started by Alibaba, but it has a very strong governmental support. Mm -hmm. And that's how things work in China. Of course, you need investments, but also you have a very strong government to give support and also subsidies to these industries. But the point I want to make, the, 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 the small business owner, and w which that video showed was maybe a, a, a father and son or husband and wife, uh, they're open to that type of uh, digital experience. Usually, uh, Ch Chinese people, they are very open to adapting. So, of course, it is much easier for you to introduce technology to the youth. Mm -hmm. But you can see a big growth of uh, older people also using technology. 
So I believe that since they open up in um, in the 80s, that that the Chinese uh, people and the consumers, they learn how to adapt. They are very business-oriented people. So in this sense, it is much easier for them to adopt a certain technologies. And they seem to do that very quickly. Yeah, very quickly, especially now with the coronavirus. Mm-hmm. Everything is moving digital mm-hmm. out of necessity. But your time there, when you first went there, you, you mentioned you left left Brazil, went to China, you uh, really decided on your own to go, uh, you went by yourself. How were you received? I want to, I want to change a little bit. How you, you, a professional woman, were you received in China? Um, there are some stereotypes, especially towards Latin women, mm-hmm. of course, maybe not only in China, but in many other countries as well. It was extremely challenging, but um, I was a bit lucky to have a Chinese uh, family that welcomed me. I met them by chance at the street because I got lost. <laughs> And uh, they are from Shandong. They are from um, a, a very known city to to for for people to be very like caring, mm-hmm. right? Right. So uh, they helped me a lot when I studied. I could not speak Chinese. I was studying the language, so I was lucky in this sense. But it, of course, it is extremely challenging. For me, the good point that China uh, would bring to me, not only to my career, but also from the um, personal perspective, was safety. Mm. Uh, As you know, Espirito Santo is one of uh, the most violent states in the country, and this really affected me and also affected my uh, decision-making process. Mm. So I always felt very safe in China. In Brazil, I would not trust a family I would meet at the street, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Um, but but in China, uh, they helped me a lot. They, they are very... Uh, well, you can have two different types of Chinese uh, people. One is the one that really welcomes foreigners, right. and the other ones that um, do not really like foreigners, mm-hmm. uh, especially maybe Japanese or Americans. They can have some uh, constraints about these nationalities. But overall, Brazil is a very is a very good country, and they have very good. Uh, perspective of Brazilians in mm-hmm. China, especially because of uh, soccer, right? right. Well, well I have to, to be fair, I have to say that when I first came to, to Brazil many years ago, and I, I uh, back to what you posted in, in, in your LinkedIn post, it reminded me of that, uh, of coming to another country, and as you, I came to Brazil, I didn't speak the language, uh, I wandered around a big city, which was Sao Paulo, and met people on the street that you know you couldn't even speak to, uh, but really at that time one of the things that I felt here, uh, what I, I felt secure. I never felt uh, uh, at any time uh, without even speaking the language. I never felt unsafe. Mm-hmm. Maybe that was because I didn't couldn't speak the language, right? And maybe you not realize yeah. that you're in an unsafe situation, but. Many Brazilians were very friendly to me, very open, and that's really mm-hmm. one of the reasons why I stayed. I, I, I felt Brazilians were warm in that. So I think part of what you just said uh, is finding the type of person that can help you uh, mm-hmm. melt your way into a country, into a new culture, is important. Yeah, it's very important. <laughs> but as a woman now, uh, we're, we're heading into uh, the International Women's Month Right, you're celebrated pretty much worldwide, and you are a very international woman. Uh, what is your multicultural global view for women in business, uh, not only in China, but worldwide? You travel quite a bit. You interact with many people. What are your suggestions to women in career planning and how to be ready for change? I do understand that usually women have uh, different challenges, especially when they are on the top level of their career. Um, And we suffer, you still suffer a lot of discrimination. Um, For example, I I can give a concrete example of sometimes, um, even like in the business environment, 
uh, men chasing women because they are pretty or they do not believe their skills because they are pretty or mm -hmm. because of their nationality. Mm -hmm. Right. So this is um, a, a big challenge. We are in 2020 and we still face this challenge, which is a bit of um, it, it's a bit shameful. But um, I found a sweet spot. So mm. if you show your knowledge, if you really impose yourself as a businesswoman, uh, usually men tend to respect you more. So you right? have to be forthcoming in that. Yeah, but um, you need to prove yourself. Mm -hmm. I think this is the bad part. You need to prove that you are really a leader in the industry. You really know your work in order for people to respect you. And especially in my industry, most of um, businessmen, they, they are, you know, male. Right. Yeah, so I am looking forward to see more women um, in the tech industry, also in the internet industry. And I do believe that in the future, this challenge will be um, much easier to, uh, instead of us having to prove ourselves, they will just respect you uh, as equal. But you're that example. I, what, what I hear you saying, uh, you need to be ready uh, for the challenges that will face you? Yeah, um, women tend to be a bit more emotional than men. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not saying all women are like this. So uh, we just need to close our ears, pretend we do not see, we do not hear, mm. and trust ourselves. Because if we get influenced by bad comments, uh, we always doubt we can be a leader. Mm. So this is what I learned throughout this process by being on my own in China from when I arrived and also by dealing with not only uh, uh, businesses in China, but also from uh, around the, wor the world. Yeah, so you, so you, you feel yeah. that's sort of the same throughout the world. There's nothing specific to China, to Brazil, to Canada. It depends on the country. Mm. Some some countries, they are more developed, mm -hmm. and some other countries still need to treat women in a more fair way. So as you travel, you adjust yourself and your behavior to each country? Yes, but always imposing myself as a leader in my industry. Which you are, and I think, as I said, is like looking through your... Just looking through your LinkedIn profile, there's no doubt about it. Uh, we need to trust ourselves and believe that, um, of course, we'll never uh, be the top one leader. But for ourselves, for our goals and what we um, strategize for our career, we need to believe that we are good, that we are always learning, improving. And as long as I can also inspire other people, I can help my students and other uh, business women. Uh, I'm I do consider myself as a leader. Uh, good point that you mentioned the students. So you you are a, a professor. Uh, have you seen a change in the female students? From let's say, if you remember back fourteen years ago, the way you were. Uh, do you see women more engaged today? They are extremely engaged, and they really think of building their own business, mm. which is very interesting. I never ever thought of having my business before because of the challenge, uh, well, the costs and everything. But now they, they are taking the risk. Mm. I think this is very good and very positive. So, well, I agree with you. I think that's one of the ways uh, it, may, it may be. You see many businesses, and looking back to the United States as an example I've been following, you have many uh, female-run businesses that do business amongst women, uh, outright help each other and help each other start businesses. Yes, exactly. Same in China. <laughs> yeah, because you're going to e-commerce uh, really is... Is genderless, right? Yes. Yes. So you don't generally know if an e-commerce site is male, female, or whatever. Uh, though most of the shoppers in China are female. 
uh, more than 70% of them. <laughs> On e-commerce? <laughs> exactly. Uh, yes. Why is that? Why do you think? Um, for different reasons, because um, maybe uh, they shop more online or they do not have time or they have family duties. Yeah, I think balancing your personal life and also your work life is extremely challenging, more specifically for women mm. uh, when they have kids, for example. Mm -hmm. So, um, but I do believe it's also because they are very open to try new things and to shop. They have different needs of, of also personal care, your skin care. Right. Yeah. Now, now, what we're talking about, just to help our listeners, you're ta you're speaking about e-commerce and, and shoppers in China. In China, okay. yes. What would you say about e-commerce e and shoppers in Brazil? What would your feeling be? Um, in Brazil, price is very important. Mm. I I advised uh, Apex, which is the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, right. to, in to incubate 32 companies here, um, sorry, there in, in the Chinese market. Mm -hmm. And I also work with Estatse, which is um, a startup ecosystem out of Brazil. Right. So I have the chance of talking to them a lot about e-commerce in Brazil. Mm -hmm. And um, price is very important. For Brazilians. <laughs> yes, for yeah. Brazilians. Right. Especially when they go and shop at AliExpress. Right. So Brazil is one of uh, the largest AliExpress um, uh, market, mm -hmm. right? So even though it might take a long time for the products to arrive in Brazil, mm -hmm. they prefer waiting than go just and shop from a, a physical shop mm. because it's much cheaper. Right. Yeah. We all know that the Brazilian costs are very high, which makes um, Brazilian business to struggle a bit from time to time. So that's why consumers in Brazil, they like shopping a lot from AliExpress. Well, I, I agree with you because uh, the, the, the impact of Brazil cost is very high. And that really, uh, for a foreigner coming here, foreign business persons coming to Brazil, I found that. You know, they're really amazed. You know, everything is so expensive, uh, comparably speaking. And then when they see that almost half of any cost, any price is made up of taxes or other duties or what have you. Mm -hmm. uh, but the price tag that they see is, is very high. Uh, and one of the things that su not surprised me, but I've gotten used to over the years, is any conversation starts with price. Uh, yes. You generally <laughs> don't start with even the briefing of what you're going to deliver or the quality of the product. And I've mentioned that. I said, well, Brazil is a, a place that has a number of restaurants uh, that you pay for the food by the weight, right? The, the preço por quilo. Mm -hmm. And people yes. go in, uh, it's a buffet style, fill their plate, and then it's weighed, and then they pay based on the weight of the, of the, the amount of food they're eating. And that's one of the mm -hmm. examples I've given that people really they'll, they'll go out, stand outside the restaurant. They want to see what the price per kilo is, and not really be aware of what the quality of the food is that's being served. And, and that's an example that I bring to other industries. I says, well, you have to be aware of what you just said. Price is important, uh, be, uh, and and people need to know. So you have to express value in Brazil in a different way. Yes, I agree with you, but at the same time, you can see all, all, all of the opportunities that the Brazilian market uh, can offer in this sense. Right. Right, because it's not mature. Mm -hmm. So there is a lot of opportunity for growth and also for consumers to change their behavior. It is a process. And everything, oh, you mentioned that from the beginning. Change can be good, but you need to be ready, right? But you also, yes. <laughs> you also have to work for change and, and you have to help make it happen, right? Yes, right. <laughs> well, very good, Renata. We're coming to the end of our time, uh, but I really want to thank you for sharing your time, uh, being with us and uh, helping us understand a little bit more about China and obviously uh, understanding more for our listeners of what it is just to get up and go and change countries and readapt to a culture. So thanks again for sharing with our listeners. 
It's my pleasure, Tom, and I am very glad to be able to speak uh, to you today and also for the Brazilian audience. Thank you. Um, yeah, I'm here to help Brazilians who want to go to China and learn more about China and also bring back all of the experience, right, they can have for uh, to have a, a great impact uh, back in Brazil as well. Very good. So... <laughs> Back to the beginning, uh, life is sweet, right? It could be sweeter in some places more than others. <laughs> yes, it is. Very good. So thanks again, Renata. My pleasure. And for our listeners, I want uh, you can find more about Renata Tiobo, and I'll spell her name. It's R-E-N-A-T-A, and her last name is T-H-I-E-B-A-U-T. You'll find her on LinkedIn. And there on our LinkedIn profile, you'll find a featured section where she lists a number of books that she reads and books that are inspirational for her. So I'd like to thank you, our audience, and our sponsor, Focus MI Market Intelligence. Focus MI specializes in market research for the Brazilian agricultural market. And more about them on their site, which is focusmi.com. Visit our website, which is www.talktobrazil, that's T-A-L-K, the number two, B-R-A-Z-I-L.com, and find our previous shows of Talk to Brazil. So remember, when you talk to Tom, you talk to Brazil and the world. Goodbye, and thanks for listening. Thanks for listening to Tom Riach on Talk to Brazil, the business connector to Brazil. 